Welcome to the Minecraft Education Edition webinar series. This session was recorded on Thursday, June 18, 2020. Hey everyone and um, welcome. I'm so excited that you've all logged into our webinar today. I think we're going to have a great session. I'm going to move my phone away so it doesn't make funny noises in the background. Hi, I'm Carrie Doring. I am actually the support manager for Minecraft Education Edition, and it's just my privilege to serve in this role for you. Our uh, goal on the support desk is to provide timely support and access to useful information for you. So if we're not quite meeting that goal, you're welcome to reach out to us through the support desk or leave a chat in our community forum. Let us know where we can improve either with just our answers from the support desk or with, you know, the articles especially. So I, I'm just putting in, you know, a little message for myself there. So we're, we, we really want to help in any way we can. Um, a little bit about me. I've been in technology for many years, many more years than I'm going to admit on this call. And I've actually had the, the ex exciting opportunity to be a developer on many educational platforms, some of which still exist today, which amazes me. Um, in the last few years, I had the opportunity to do um, some coding after school with kids and I got a firsthand opportunity to see what a powerful tool Minecraft can be to achieve learning objectives and I've also seen some of the challenges of using you know gamified learning. Um, that brought me to this role where I've just been having an amazing time and love being on the team and I could go on and on but what I should do is pass you on to my colleague Maria who's going to tell you a little bit about herself and um, help us get kicked off. Thank you, Kiri, for introductions. Um, my name is Maria and uh, I am working on Minecraft Education team. Um, I am in charge of content and specifically computer science content. So I am super, super excited to be with you today um, and to be in this webinar. So if you have any questions in regards to coding in Minecraft or any questions about curriculum or content um, on coding, please leave them in chat uh, so that I can tackle them. Uh, and the session today uh, will be led by Kathy Isaacs, who is a um, professional development specialist with I2E. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you, Maria. So I'm Kathy Chow Isaacs at I Wear the Crowns on Twitter. In case you're on social media, I am, as Maria said, a professional learning specialist with I2E. I am super excited to be with you today to talk about coding in Minecraft. And um, I'm going to have some special guests a little bit later. Um, Trish Cloud is a global, Trish Cloud and Mary Hoffmeister are both Minecraft global mentors and they'll be joining us a little bit later to tell us what they are up to um, with Minecraft and coding. So a little bit about myself, what you ought to know is that I love to code, um, especially in Minecraft. Um, coding in Minecraft is a source of creativity. It's a place for problem solving, and it's a way for us to exercise our computational thinking muscles. So with coding, kids have agency to make Minecraft a game that they love, um, make it behave however it is that they want. So when it comes to computational thinking, okay, computational thinking is made up of four components, okay, and um, they are decomposition, which is breaking down a problem into smaller manageable parts, uh, pattern recognition, so seeing where things are similar and where patterns exist within a problem, abstraction, um, which is the act of looking through all of these patterns and picking out the most important things, and lastly, algorithmic thinking, which is coming up with a plan that someone can and the rules that someone can follow step by step to solve a problem. In 2006, Jeanette Wing defined comp computational thinking as the thought processes involved in formulating a problem and expressing its solution in such a way that a computer, whether human or machine, could effectively carry it out. 
and she um, contends that computation, comp computational thinking is a fundamental skill for not just computer science scientists, but for everyone. And that these skills can are effective and can um, have benefit in all areas of our life. So enter Minecraft. Okay, from Hour of Code to text-based coding in JavaScript, Minecraft offers many opportunities for students and teachers to experience coding. Okay, so how do you start coding in Minecraft? Well, some of you may have already um, met your agent. So C is for code when it comes to Minecraft. And we have our agent character that you may have met by accident. Well, this agent is the, to me, the agent is the best character in Minecraft because what you can do with your agent is you can help have your agent help you with anything that you want in Minecraft. So long as you give it explicit instructions on how to do that. So well, how do you give it instructions, right? So when you start Code Builder, you have a choice. You can choose a code editor from two code editors. One is Tinker, which is a freemium uh, coding content partner, and the other is Microsoft MakeCode. Um, MakeCode is Microsoft's free open source platform, um, and it's available with a variety of different of devices. Um, what I think is fantastic about it is that you have the ability to create really engaging computer science experiences and these experiences can support a progression path to real world programming. How do you ask? Well, Microsoft Make Code consists of a block editor, which many kids who have um, experienced coding before are going to be really familiar with. They've seen platforms similar to this and um, you know, the blocks are all color coded and organized by category. So it makes it kind of easy to find the code that you need, the commands that you need to accomplish a task. There's also a simulator. So what happens is you build your code in Code Builder, and then when you take it back in game, you can see immediately what, how the code is impacting your game. And then this to me is, well, okay, everything is gonna sound like the best part, but this is really, really great. So with Code Builder, and I mean, not Code Builder, Make Code, the fantastic thing about Make Code is that you can transition or swap so easily between block and text-based code. So the JavaScript I mentioned earlier, all you have to do is press a button and your code will be transformed or translated from block to text. And just recently, the Make Code team added Python to the text-based options. So that is really fantastic. Um, it has been found that when kids use both types of programming at the same time, it helps the students transition from block to text-based programming most successfully. So the more they see it, the more comfortable they are with seeing the text and seeing the block, they're going to have the most success when it comes to real world programming. OK, so when you launch Code Builder, what you will see is the Code Builder interface or dashboard. Now you could get started and just press that big green button and start a brand new project. Um, but you could also, you might find that you're overwhelmed, so you could also choose from one of 19 step-by-step -step guided tutorials in the tutorial section. Um, when you choose one of the projects to build, you can say, I would like to learn how to do this in block, I want to learn how to do this in Python, or I want to learn how to do this in JavaScript. So you could pick one or all of them. So how great is that? 
So not only are these tutorials step by step, but when you enter a tutorial, and this is an example of one of the block based tutorials, Code Builder only gives you the blocks you need. So there's no question that when um, the agent up there in the tutorial bar says, hey, you need a chat command. By the way, it's blue. You know that you're just going to go to player. You're going to grab out the drag out that chat command, put it in the workspace. And then um, when you expand any of those command drawers, and that's the image on the right, you'll see that only those commands are available. So it eliminates a lot of overwhelm, I think. Um, the other thing I think that is awesome, and this is an example of the Python code. So over here, it says, um, this is what the code is going to do. This is what your code should look like. And then this little less button, um, I expanded it so that it would say more. But what this does is it explains what the code will do, which is so, so important. It's more than just about dragging the blocks in the right order. It's also about being able to tell what the code does. And so if you have students that um, you know, want to go and take the AP class, and I know like some of us are elementary teachers and you know, high school students, I know that on the AP test, that's what you have to do. You have to be able to elaborate on what your code is doing. So those are the tutorials. And then um, this I think is so cool. I think everything is cool. So the live coding. So since the stay at home um, orders have been in place, uh, one of the developers on Make Code, he has been, well, the whole team, the team has been doing live coding every single day, but the Make Code team, they've had um, one of the developers and one of his kids uh, doing a Minecraft tutorial um, every day, every week. I don't really know what the um, frequency is, but what they do is they live code for about a half an hour a day, and then they post the videos onto the Code Builder dashboard so that you could watch window in window and run the tutorial, uh, build the tutorial with some support. You can also, in Code Builder, if you scroll further down the dashboard, you have the ability to maybe just pull some code snippets and then modify them. So there are these really cool activities here like building checkers, having the agent build things for you, or um, having some cool things happen in game like jumping really high or having flowers get placed whenever you walk. If you choose one of these, um, what you'll get is all of the code that works, and then you can just make changes to see how your changes impact the world. Okay, yesterday, Andy was on and he shared about the extensive lesson library and available in game. Um, there are, there's a whole subject kit available for computer science. There are hour of code lessons, learn to code plus STEM, two coding courses and um, additional coding lessons. I think one of the additional has to do with the um, aquatic update from when that happened in Minecraft education a, a little while ago. So really, really um, great places to start for learning how to code. Okay, also available in the lesson library um, are the code builder tutorial. This is like the original code building lesson. So this world has 10 challenges for you to take your agent through, um, just kind of progressively getting more challenging. Um, this, this I, I do love that world. Um, and then there's also a Minecraft code town. Uh, for you with, I think that what you have to do is you have to gather the pieces of a puzzle through um, completing the code challenges and then you can um, create a mural for the town. So other coding resources available in the library include the build challenges. There are two um, that are pictured here. 
One is agent to the rescue and the other is harvest time. So one has to do with farming. Um, and then if you join us tomorrow, uh, the fabulous Melissa Renchi will be here to share more about all of the build challenges that are available in game. Okay. You can also do some of the Hour of Code tutorials on code.org. So um, the original code.org Hour of Code um, tutorials are on, <laughs> they're on the code.org website and um, you can access those there. You can also try out the latest Hour of Code tutorial, which is Minecraft AI for good. Um, that is the first um, hour of code tutorial that's available in game. So um, the four on the top are available online and actually one of them is available offline and then AI for good is available in game. If you want to learn more about that, you can go to the Minecraft hour of code um, on my hour of code page on the Minecraft educator site. OK, there's also and if there wasn't more, there's also um, complete computer science curriculum available online. There's the computing with Minecraft. Um, this is for maybe like grades three to five, three to six, and then an older um, curriculum for ages 11 to 16. So um, I first started using Code Builder with my second and third graders. Uh, we had a coding club and um, one of the things that we were learning about was pixel art. So the kids had created their pixel art on paper and what we learned was that as you increase the number of pixels, your pictures get more detailed. And um, so we I said, OK, we are going to take this pixel art. We are going to build this in Minecraft. So they were pretty excited about that possibility using Minecraft. Lots of hoorays. Um, and then I said, well, I have a feeling that you are going to be able to build your pixel art. No problem in Minecraft. So what I want to do is I want to challenge you instead of building it in Minecraft, I would like for you to code it in Minecraft. And the response I got was pretty incredible because they were like, oh, you are challenging us, Mrs. Chow Isaacs? I take that on. I like that very much. And so what they saw, um, instead of seeing it as a build, they saw it as a problem to solve. And for so many of the kids, they were like, oh, I, I like this. I'm totally taking this on. And when we talked about it afterwards, the kids were, I said, well, what did you like this activity? And what did you like about it? And they were like, you know what I liked, Mrs. Chow Isaacs? I liked that I got to use my brain. I was like, that's enough for me. Um, I loved hearing that. So um, part of the coding, uh, one of the things, so just not just coding, but like, one of the things that I love about Minecraft is its open endedness, right? Um, so Minecraft can be a, a different experience for everybody that plays it. Uh, when I first started playing, I'm that kid that was like, OK, you want me to build a house? I'll build it. Um, and then if the if someone said, oh, you can do whatever you want, then I kind of got stuck. Right, but I did that uh, pixel art activity with my kids and I built I built my art in Minecraft, which took me an hour and a half. Um, and then I took on the challenge of coding my pixel art in Minecraft as well. And um, that also took me an hour and a half, but um, I had I, I just the sense of satisfaction I got was pretty incredible, right? So um, this computing with Minecraft curriculum is really, really awesome. Um, it's based on the theme of coding a town, right? And um, one of the, so you code the roads, you code the monuments, and then one of the activities is code a building. 
Um, and so when I went through the curriculum, I was like, okay, well, I could code a building, but what kind of building could I design that would be meaningful to me? So I thought, all right, if I'm going to do this activity, I will go ahead and code a building that is meaningful to me. So on the left hand side, um, there is my the work in progress. Um, I used some of the assessment tools that Mike shared about on Tuesday. So you'll see that there are some signs on the structure on the building. Um, this involved. Recognizing I mean all of the computational thinking components that we talked about earlier. So recognizing patterns. Or, or even decomposition. So here's a building. How would I break this down? Well, there is a jumper. There are two feet. There are two arms, right? And recognizing that the feet would be exactly the same, but maybe in a different place. Utilizing the 3D coordinate grid of Minecraft um, and really keeping track of lots and lots of things, seeing what was important and um, the steps that had to happen in what in a certain order. Um, so anyway, to say that this was engaging, uh, this was a multi week project, um, so it was it was engaging to say the least. And um, there's a half finished project. There was a lot of iteration involved. Um, I'm going to cross my fingers that you can see. So hours and hours invested. And now that the code has been written, this build can happen in 30 seconds. And the build can be taken anywhere. So you learn that code um, exists and you can reuse it time and time and again. And ta-da! So I, um, to say I'm proud of myself uh, to, is, is um, yeah, to say the least, right? I'm a little, I'm patting myself on the back even now. So to just kind of think about, you know, what that would mean for a kid. Um, the accomplishment in um, completing a code, completing a build in code is pretty powerful. OK, so um, things that we also love about Minecraft or that we and we literally say this in the house. So Steve Isaacs, that's my husband. He was here on Monday talking about Minecraft. Um, we say that Minecraft um, is a tool that has a low floor and a high ceiling. Right, so meaning that you could use Minecraft or even and it applies to code builder. You could use it for something really basic like making your agent move, right? Let's just make our helper coding agent move. That's that's a huge accomplishment um, or make your agent build something, place some blocks, dig some holes. Um, make sure that the agent, if there's anything in its way, have it destroy the block so it can still continue the build. Or even fun things like spawn an entity, bring a chicken in the world, add a loop, bring a gazillion chickens into your world, right? So that's those are examples of like um, things that you can do with with even your youngest students, right? So low floor and then high ceiling. So this happens to be my current ceiling. Um, using conditional loops, if then statements, variables, functions, fill commands, and a 3D coordinate grid. I mean, that is pretty, I mean, pretty crazy if you ask me. So um, those computational thinking tools in do get to be applied. Okay, so this is another uh, build uh, that I did, <laughs> that was, that we did and um, so here, the thing that was so interesting was that um, I observed in myself. Just that, you know, I would see the pattern like here's a pattern for the fence. This is where the agent needs to be to place um, the the posts and where it needs to place the crossbars and then that roof. Seeing. 
like kind of mapping out where the roof should be and realizing, wow, there's a pattern here. And you know what? We should use a variable. To have that, to observe that kind of thinking it is just pretty amazing, you know, and just the sense of accomplishment that uh, a, that a stu your students uh, will have when they are able, when they do this kind of work. So um, in closing, I just want to say, um, you know, I want to ask, what will your students craft with code? So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Maria, who is going to share about some exciting new resources coming to Minecraft Education Edition. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, it was so amazing to, to listen to Kathy uh, talk us through everything that has been done in Code Builder. And, and uh, I think I've been browsing through the questions um, that um, our audience has been asking. There's a lot of excitement about the, the, um, the Kitty code. Um, so Kathy, if you can share the code with us, that would be amazing. And I think uh, generally there's a lot of excitement in terms of tutorials and curriculum and the coding piece um, in Minecraft. Uh, so thank you very much, Kathy, for sharing all the best practices um, you did with us. Um, I think some of you have been asking uh, the question, Kathy, uh, Kathy seems to know so much about coding and how to code in Minecraft. How do I get to the same level? Is it difficult? Will, will it be quick? Will it be, will it be a long journey? Um, I, I will tell you that if, um, if the resources that we put together, uh, you will start with the resources that we put together, um, the journey is um, it's kind of you always are learning with Minecraft. Uh, it's never it's a never ending story with Minecraft. I think it's a, a it's an easy beginning and it's a continuation of engagement with students um, and or with your journey. So here, uh, what I wanted to share with you um, is um, how we are looking at our progression. And I think there were several questions in chat in regards to progression, in regards to when do I introduce JavaScript? When do I introduce Python to the students? Um, so how we in Minecraft Education are looking at the progression, uh, we call it a learning arc with code, and we look at it from elementary to middle to high school. Um, and if you can see, we start with block-based coding and we start with computational thinking. So a lot of the things that Kathy was talking about um, is, is covered in our curriculum in elementary school. And then we slowly are introducing text-based coding. What does that mean? Um, it means that we are introducing lessons where you can switch between block-based coding and JavaScript and Python. So basically, students will be able to replay the activities um, in different languages, and that's how we start experimenting with text-based coding. And then finally, we we go into text-based coding completely, um, and this is when uh, we introduce our Python curriculum, specifically text-based coding, where you will see syntax come in um, and all the other um, coding aspects will come in. So I think it's pretty important for you to know that when we're thinking about curriculum, we're thinking about four important pillars for us. Um, and we start with student-centered learning. What does it mean? It's always for us important to, um, to grow independent leaders, independent thinkers um, and creators, decision makers. So it's pretty important for us to, in any lesson plan, um, to think about students as creators. And obviously, Minecraft is such a presents such a great opportunity to to work on 21st century skills, skills like creativity, um, skills like critical thinking and collaboration, of course, that will come handy in uh, collaborative builds in, um, in multiplayer activities. Now, obviously for us, what's important is tangible learning outcomes. So any of the curriculum that we're putting together, any of the lesson plans that we're putting together, we always are thinking about standards and coverage of standards such as CSTA and ISTE. And when we're thinking about activities and we're thinking about lesson plans, 
we are trying to put together a comprehensive set of materials. So what does that mean? It means that not only the activities will be uh, in Minecraft, you will have some unplugged activities, you will have some guiding questions and answers uh, for you to use. There will be some guided activities and controlled practice uh, for you to learn um, and, um, and teach the students. And last but not least is a cross-curricular approach. The cross-curricular approach as well is super important for us and, and is something that Minecraft does so well. Um, in elementary school especially, uh, there is a lens through which we look at computer science, we look at coding. Um, unfortunately, not all elementary school teachers will have time to introduce coding, so that's why we blend coding into lessons in math or lessons in ELA. And something that, something that coding can do uh, for example, an agent can build structures like walls or do some mundane activities that the students would not want to do uh, by themselves. Um, and moving on to, to the preview of curriculum, we're super, super excited to share with you some of our newest curriculum that will be available pretty soon. So first of all, the blog-based uh, curriculum uh, that you see on the screen right now. And actually, um, I think Trish will talk a little bit about that. Uh, Trish Cloud on the call was working with us on the curriculum um, to make it happen. So thank you so much, Trish. Um, again, um, the pictures that are here, you will see you will see that, for example, in the um, in the picture, we see the bears uh, and the activity is that the bears are located on different islands um, and the student's mission is to connect the islands to build bridges with code so that all the bears will go into one spot. Um, also, the computational thinking, what Kathy was talking about, uh, we look at we we'll look at the, uh, we will be in a spaceship and we will be looking at space uh, and we will be looking at the uh, rings of Saturn. So, and um, the students will be able to see how the agent will be able to move from point A to point B to point C to point D. And this is how we visually demonstrate the movement of the agent. Um, and obviously what I wanted to mention is that we have different approach to different curriculums. So we create something like a menu of curriculum for you um, so that you can try pick and choose different types of lessons. We have some lessons with pre-built worlds. What does that mean? It means that the students, when, uh, when they enter the world, they will enter the story um, and the story will lead them through the coding activities. We have some open-ended activities where you will have just tutorials attached to the world and the main role of the student is to build out that story and to connect the story to what they want it to be connected. Um, I also wanted to share with you our Python curriculum uh, that is coming. It's Python 101. Um, and uh, the whole premise of the story is that the students are helping a software company um, that is called Coding Mine. Um, and the software development company has a lot of issues and a lot of problems. Um, and students are the ones who are solving the problems with code and helping other developers work it out. Um, something that I am very, very excited about um, is um, the fact that right now in, in uh, Minecraft Education Edition, you have two different opportunities to use Python. One opportunity is something that Kathy was talking about, which is Python make code. So in make code, you can toggle between blog based coding, Python and JavaScript. And the curriculum that I'm talking about right now uh, lives in, in make code and uh, it will have tutorials for the students and it will have the world. However, this summer uh, we're bringing a new editor, a new Python editor, which will look like this. Um, and I am beyond excited to introduce this to you. Um, I really, really love the styling of the editor. This is Azure Notebooks that's coming to Minecraft Education Edition. And we also release it with a with a starter kit materials. What does that mean? It means that you can start exploring Azure Notebooks um, with already with a beta release that potentially will happen in the next two weeks. 
um, and we're bringing to you a set of different tutorials and lessons. So we will show you on the next slide how the tutorials will look like. Yeah, so these are the tutorials that will leave in Azure Notebooks. Uh, and you can start again. I will just um, I will say it again. It should be available within the next two weeks. Um, you should go ahead and try them out with our beta build. Thank you very much. This was my update, my exciting update, my, my exciting news on um, a big rollout of curriculum. Um, and uh, I would like to uh, to give the mic back to Kathy. Maria. I yes. am screaming back here. This is so <laughs> exciting. I know. I was on mute. I was cheering the whole time. <laughs> I can't wait. Oh my goodness. So Maria, thank you so much for sharing all this new curriculum. That, I mean, yeah, I'm super duper psyched. Thank goodness it's going to be summer, right? So, <laughs> um, so now, yeah, yeah um, now we have some special guests. Uh, we have two global Minecraft mentors, um, Trish Cloud and Mary Hoffmeister. Um, I'm going to start with saying hi to Mary. Hi, Mary. Hi, Kathy. I am excited to be here with y'all today. All right, thanks. Can you? Um, well, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us how can you share how you are using Minecraft in your district? So um, I am Mary Hoffmeister and I currently serve as an instructional technology specialist for the Cherokee County School District. We are just north of Atlanta, Georgia in the southeastern United States and we are a um, suburban school district with about 40,000 students. So we have been, we're on about our third um, year of our Minecraft implementation across the district. We started with a small pilot and have now expanded it to be open to all students and teachers within our district to use and a lot of our journey has really been focused on professional development and we have in particular begun a focus on using Minecraft with our computer science uh, with a computer science focus so we have been able to offer two-day trainings on computational thinking and coding in Minecraft in particular and using some of the coding curriculum that Maria and you talked about earlier um, we have given teachers some pretty extensive trainings on that and we um, are are looking to continue to expand that across the district because Georgia is rolling out new computer science standards of excellence this year that start from K through 12. So we are hoping that Minecraft um, is going to help us with particularly the computational thinking sides of that because our students and teachers are hungry for more Minecraft opportunities. So. Oh, that's really, really awesome. So, um, like, what has been your experience, like, um, in terms of engagement and getting 100% engagement for coding um, in, in a class? So what we have found, and I think that this has been pretty universal at all levels, kindergarten through high school, um, because our focus in professional development with teachers was that when they used Minecraft, they needed to make sure that their activities were relevant, that they had some clear learning objectives, and that they were strongly tied to standards or benchmarks of some sort. Um, by doing that, we have found that the engagement has kind of been off the chain. Like kids are super excited and they can't wait to discover new ways to show things and really they can't wait to outsmart their teachers. Oh, well, of course. They love doing that, don't they? <laughs> They get super excited about being able to show their teachers what they learned to do with coding. And we've had even in like where, where a classroom's having a traditional Minecraft lesson where a kid's like, well, you know, you can code that. And if you just press C, it brings up the agent and you can set it up and you can do other stuff while this is working. And they teach each other that. So oh it's been really gosh. cool for us to see that kind of, you know, I mean, when you've got a seven year old telling his classmates, hey, just press C and put these blocks together and it'll build it for you. It's really spectacular to see. Oh my gosh, that is so, so awesome. So do you feel like, um, okay, so then do you have your classroom teachers kind of, I mean, you said that there's the PD, so it all, 
to me, it kind of all starts with the PD, right? So if your leadership is on board, then that's going to, you're more likely to have to have a PD, right? Absolutely. And that has been, I mean, with our, when, when we started, even with our small pilot, it started with our chief information officer and our superintendent going to our cabinet and our board and letting them know that we were, you know, looking at this type of an idea. So our leadership from the top down has been super supportive and that has allowed us some really great opportunities to um, to offer this. I mean, we were even able, um, as 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 an instructional technology team, to provide training at all school sites last year on computational thinking to all teachers. So all teachers were able to participate in a training where they learned about abstraction, decomposition, and all of those components of computer science and computational thinking that they don't always think about as a 12th grade language arts teacher, right? Of course that, that not. No, of what that. they do every day. And so that was the beauty of that opportunity was that it really gave us the opportunity to say you're doing computational thinking in your subject area, whether you realize it or not. But this is the way that we can deepen this experience for all of our students. And like I said, we, we have been so blessed and fortunate that our, um, our CIO, um, Bobby Blunt, and our superintendent, Dr. Brian Hightower, have been so spectacular and supportive of us. Oh, that sounds like such an, ex an incredible experience. Um, but I was wondering, so like for for me, I uh, my former role was an int uh, integration uh, technology integration specialist. And have you found um, in your role that there are teachers who are hesitant to take this on? And if you have, um, how, how do you help them? Um, we, we have found that in a lot of cases, and I, I'll highlight one um, really probably my favorite training example. Um, so we had uh, one of our three hour Minecraft training sessions and we had a teacher sign up and she was like, I'm really not sold on this. I kind of was told I have to be here, but let's just see what this does. And she was, you know, she, she was trying. It was not her thing. She had never been a gamer. The whole concept of gaming was kind of foreign to her. And so it took a little a while but then it took a hook and for her the hook was being able to use portfolios and the book and quill to document and for students to have a writing opportunity in Minecraft. Mm. So what I have found is with all of the resistance that we've come across as long as you find that thing that makes the application relevant to that teacher or speak to them on their level because you know, not everybody is going to be super excited about the coding components like you and I get really excited when Maria starts talking about a Python experience. I'm like, that's fabulous. But not all of our, and, and we just know that not all of our teachers, that's going to be their thing. But that's the beauty, I think, of Minecraft across the board is that Minecraft allows us such a phenomenal opportunity to expand and use it in lots of different ways mm -hmm. that really it works for all subjects and it works for all age levels, um, just depending on how it's transformed and used in each individual classroom. And I think that has been one of the things that was kind of unexpected for me because I didn't expect it to have such a global appeal across subject areas and age levels um, and, and to really be able to find that thing for all of those teachers that come in and they're a little resistant and they see something and they get super excited about. Oh, Mary, that is so, so awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with Minecraft with us at, in uh, Cherokee County. Um, thank you. That it's so inspirational. So now I would like to say hello to Trish Cloud. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. I so Maria said, and I kind of heard before she said it that you were up to some really cool stuff with curriculum. Would you share that with us, please? Well, um, as I, I work in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools in North Carolina, um, we are the second largest school district in the state. We serve about 150,000 students with 10,000 teachers. Um, we've, um, I've been talking a lot with our continuing education, our career technical education people because we seem to see a gap because we have some students who come into middle school who are ready to go and who are ready to learn um, all about 
computer science, they, they're, they've already got some background knowledge. But then what we're seeing is that we have students who don't. So across our district, we're really trying to develop a plan to where when students hit sixth grade, they know what sequencing is. They know what an algorithm is. They know what a variable is. They know what conditional, what a conditional is. So that when they hit, they're ready to go to the next level. Um, I've recently found out because just like Georgia, North Carolina is in the process of develop of adopting K-12 computer science standards for everyone. Um, I do believe that our state is buying, is uh, providing a Minecraft curriculum for all of our middle schoolers. No because, way. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, um, so what I've been working on with Maria is what better gateway to get kids into computer science, which in reality, if they're just looking at the words, could be a little dry, but just what you've shown us, it's not. It fits in with everything. It fits in with storytelling. It fits in with history because history happens in a sequence. We do algorithms every day of our life. It's just making those connections for the students. So that's what Maria and I have been doing. We have been building a curriculum for students that is very hybrid. That is, some of it is they do by themselves. Some of it is collaborative work. Some of it is um, unplugged. But at the same time, we're also wanting to teach them that computer science is very creative. Because I think a lot of times people forget because we get so boxed into well, I have to do this, then I do this, then I do this. Well, yes, that's true. But your one, two, three may be different than their one, two, three. So as we're developing this curriculum that we're going to send to elementary students is teaching them that not everybody's answer is going to be the same. The way you solve a problem may be different than the way the other person solved the problem. Give yourself the freedom to be creative with your code. Go ahead and try new things. Don't be afraid. You can't break it. Go ahead and try new things because that's one of the things that I've always sort of taught my kids because I started using Minecraft in my district about eight years ago. And so through Minecraft clubs and then Minecraft coding clubs, so on and so forth, I've always tried to teach them to be brave in pursuing the goal. And so it's it's because I just keep telling them you can't break it. We can fix it. So go ahead and do what it is that you do to solve your problem because that's what our goal is. So what we're trying to teach them in this curriculum with some amazing, amazing maps. I have shown the maps to my daughters as I've been working on this curriculum and both my daughters who are in college are like, whoa, can, can, can I do that? Oh, <laughs> because that's great. The maps are just amazing and they do different things. They're going to space. They're going to different places all over the world to help animals. They're um, the last part, they're going back in time and doing things with dinosaurs, but it's all about teaching them to use the code that we've taught them and use it creatively and use it in a problem solving way. And at the same time, we're showing them this applies to real life. Yep. Absolutely. And putting it in a way that um, teachers will be easily able to communicate the concept because if you think about something like a conditional it could be a little hard to describe but uh -huh. we try to put it in everyday language so a teacher can communicate it to an eight-year-old a nine-year-old a ten-year-old to where they can wrap their mind around what they're doing but we don't want it to be too complicated to where it's going to blow their mind. So it's just giving them enough 
right, to where they go to middle school and learn more. Right, that fine line. Like, that all right, line. we exactly. want to give you everything, but not too much, not too <laughs> much. So I was just curious, um, like in your experience, how long do um, builds in Minecraft Education Edition take? A build can, okay, um, <laughs> it, 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 are we talking about coding a build or are we talking about just the build? Well, maybe you could touch on both. So just okay. a build and then coding a build. All right, so in the lesson that I did where um, the two classes built an art museum. That's that, an incredible, incredible lesson, by the way. Thank you very much. You're welcome, I love that. I share it all the time. Thank you. It was it was an awesome lesson to, to develop with my art teacher. That build took a long time just because we we had like 200 students working on it and it just the art part plus the build part just took time because they wanted it perfect. Um, oh, what can I interrupt? Sure. Can I, can I just butt in for a second? So with that, like the art museum. So first of all, 200 kids in a build, that's a little bit mind blowing. Um, so I think there's like there's a question brewing like in my head about how you manage that. But then also, do you find that the kids spend more time building or if they spend more time researching what they're building about? There was a combination of the two going on. Now, let me um, break that down a little bit. It one museum was built by our entire fifth grade, which was uh -huh. 100 students and the other museum was built by the entire fourth grade. So what happened is, is I would have 30 students at a time and they would be working on it and they would work on it during their computer time. Then uh -huh. another class would come in. And what I did is I divided the museum into north, south, east, west. And then I assigned classes to each quadrant of the uh -huh. map so that they knew what part they were working on and then they had to collaborate together to make their sections blend to make sure the architecture matched up and that their interiors looked the same so they were doing research in their art class once a week and then they were coming to me once a week to work on the minecraft part uh -huh. um, when we're doing coding lessons and they're building things with code we try to keep them smaller just because of time constraints. Okay. You know, when you're thinking about a, an elementary teacher, she is working in a day, she's got eight hours and she's teaching seven subjects and we're trying to shoehorn in another one. So one of the largest goals that I've tried to focus on is not being burdensome, keeping things entertaining, educational, but time-wise because we're trying to, to to work into a day that doesn't have a lot of leeway to begin right. with uh -huh. but if we can do that in a way that it flows with their day and gives them um, an opportunity to learn something new and do something that is going to be highly engaging to their students that's a win yeah oh absolutely Trish, thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Oh, yeah. I, I do. I miss you <laughs> so much. And it's so great to hear about all this wonderful work that you're doing. Um, yeah. And I just want to thank you and Mary. Thank you so much for being our guests today and, and like sharing the wonderful things that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Hearts to you both. Thanks. Thank you so much for having us. You're welcome. So um, I hear um, I hear that there are a few questions for me in the chat, and uh, we're going to take a couple of minutes to answer them. Yes, there are, Kathy. We've got quite a few people are all over your Hello Kitty. So the first question is, is can you share your Hello Kitty code or those worlds? Are they somewhere where educators can get to them? Um, well, I have I do have the code and I'm happy to share them. OK, so maybe we could send that up in a follow, yeah, we can. A follow so, email. Um, yep. So I guess one of the things in Code Builder when you're on the dashboard, one option over to the right is um, there's an import button. 
So when you click on that import button, you can either um, save, uh, you can bring in code that's been saved as a file. You can also bring in code from a URL, and I'm happy to share either. I, or both, I have it. <laughs> Great, well, we'll make sure that those get shared in the follow-up email that we're gonna send to everybody who is joining us today. So Excellent. thank you for that. I'm sure lots of people will appreciate it. And then we had another question about how long did it take your grade two students to complete the project that you had them working on? Oh, so, okay, so these, my grade two and three, this was a coding club after school. We met once a week. Um, for I guess maybe an hour after school and so uh, they it probably took them uh, two or three sessions but like you know we they had a lot of familiarity with other learn to code tools right so they kind of knew where things went how they had to snap together and um, you know we had some experience kind of with um, the algorithms and where blocks need the order in where the blocks needed to be in order to make things work, right? So they had, because of that kind of uh, uh, foundation, uh, they were able to be like, oh, okay, so I see that this category of code is similar to um, this one in a different coding platform. So they were really kind of, um, it was not quite seamless, you know, because second and third grade after school, um, but they, it, it was, I guess it wasn't like starting from scratch because they had some experience. So I would say like two or three weeks to build and problem solve. Yep. Okay, awesome. So we had another question about, and this was for, for all you educators, Kathy and Pat uh, Trish and Mary. We have somebody who asked, how many hours do the kids get a week on Minecraft or coding with Minecraft specifically? So I'm sure for all of you that varies in how teachers approach it, but Trish, do you want to, you just did that amazing, well, not just, you uh, did that amazing museum project, and I know the kids worked on it. So how much time do you think teachers on average spend doing Minecraft in their classrooms? Like, is it a separate activity or a separate lesson, or do they integrate it with a lesson they already have? And if so, how long do they spend? And and there, therein lies the biggest, the biggest issue is um, now um, I know that my that uh, a teacher that I worked with was spending about an hour a day because she was using a math lesson to teach fractions. Um, then I know that there was a smaller lesson that only took about 15 minutes. It's it's not. Um, I think it's not based on the Minecraft. It's based on what you're teaching. So if you're teaching math and you've got five minutes to demonstrate um, area and perimeter, you can do it in Minecraft. If you're doing a huge lesson on settlers settling in Jamestown or learning to walk around the Mesopotamian Peninsula, that lesson is going to take like an hour and it may take more than one class session. It's I, I think it's more based on what's being taught rather than on the Minecraft. Great. Thank, thanks, Trish. Mary, do you have any other thing to add to that or to Trish? Um, go I was going to say that I would completely um, second what Trish said there about and, and it's it's part of what we tell our teachers as they're planning to use Minecraft is that it's based on your curricular needs and as long as it's tied strongly to your curriculum you're going to find the way to make that work and make it fit and that's so it does vary and you know a volume lesson is going to be very different than a lesson on resources and economics so it does just depend on the classroom and the standards. Awesome. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Kathy and Trish and Mary, for um, answering those questions. I think we got the vast majority of them, of them um, answered. And those of you who want to want Hello Kitty, we promise we'll send it in the follow up. <laughs> email. So, um, so with that, Kathy, I'm going to turn the time back over to you for our we're right at time. So we want to hurry into our oh, next yeah, step okay. and, and last. So it's all on you. Okay, it's all me. So I just wanted to, one of the things that stood out that Trish had mentioned about working with the kids and computational thinking was, we just want you to be brave, right? So, um, you know, there's a quote in that Jeanette Wing article where she says, um, computational methods and models give us the courage 
to solve problems and design systems that none, no one of us would be capable of tackling alone. And I think that that rings so true. Like when you have these computational thinking skills, um, you're, you're going to have the courage to take on bigger and more amazing projects. Let's say projects, but like things in your life, right? So, um, you know, that that's my kind of what I want to close with in terms of computational thinking. Um, I want to invite or just say, hey, hopefully you will be joining us tomorrow. Um, same time with the, like I said, she's fabulous, Melissa Renchi. She's going to be talking about all of the build challenges that are available in Minecraft Education Edition. And um, I think that there is like a raffle that's going to happen and you'll get your own set of build challenge cards, which are really, really awesome. And um, also, Lastly, next step. So what do we do next, right? I'm so in. I'm so excited. I need to get more Minecraft in my life. You can stay involved with the Minecraft educator community. So go to education.minecraft.net, sign up for the newsletter, consider um, becoming Microsoft Minecraft certified. Um, there is a free online course where you can earn all sorts of badges. And then also you can also think about if you're already certified, you can think about becoming a global Minecraft mentor. OK, or you can even just check out the hour of code lesson. So and then lastly, um, we invite you to redeem an achievement code for attending the session today, what you would need to do is visit education.microsoft.com. Uh, when you sign in, you can sign in with your Microsoft or your Office 365 account. And then at the top right corner, you're gonna see um, either your profile picture or your initials. When you click on that, you're gonna have a, a menu and one of the items that's there is a uh, redeem achievement code. And what you'll do is you will redeem this code with the dash and you will have, um, you'll earn points, you'll have it added to your training tracker on the educator site and um, you'll have like, um, what is it called? Oh, a training transcript so that if your school requires some proof of PD that was independent of what your school or your district is offering, then you have it right in your hand. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Special thanks to Maria and Carrie and our global mentors. Um, I challenge you all to check out the Hour of Code lessons on the Minecraft Educator community. So thank you so, so much, and we'll see you again soon.